welcome to the Festival of Storytellers. can't tell you how excited I am to be on right now. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks of, of excitement, uh, getting prepared, and I've done a lot of things in my life, but this has got to be close to the top. Thank you. And Reed is magnet. And I thank you, John, for um, putting this forth and taking the chance on our authors in, in, uh, in presenting this out to, to the world. I've, I've enjoyed this immensely, Joanne. Ellie, so have I. Thank you for, for who you are. And thank you, Reader's Magnet. You all are beautiful and you've worked so very hard. And we are blessed. We are. I thank everybody that's involved with this process because we know writers need readers and writers need publishers. We thank Readers Magnet and everybody that's involved. I love Readers Magnet. They say, we share your stories with the world. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to you. And I just want to say welcome. I am hope that you're uh, having a wonderful Monday. Uh, it's been a beautiful day here in Northeast Alabama. A little bit cool this morning, but the, the sun is up and the colors are just stunning. So it's uh, if you've never been here, it's a great place to be. Uh, my name is Bobby J. McLaren, uh, as you can see from the scrolling underneath the screen. And I am the author of a book, The Sounds at River's Edge. Um, I wrote it back in uh, well the early 2000s, but did not get it published until 2007. Um, the reason that I waited until actually this year to actually begin marketing my book is because my mom had passed away in 2007. And I just kind of uh, working a full time job, 60 to you know 65 hours a week. And I just kind of lost interest in, in putting it out there. Because these are a lot, these are true stories about growing up in Florida. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about that right now. Um, I grew up in South Florida. Uh, I was born 1954. So all of you math mathematicians, I, I'm actually 67 years old. I used to revert it when I was like 65 because that was 56, you know, 64, you were 46. But now I'm 67 and I don't want to be 76 yet. So we're good. But anyways, I was born in 1954, and I grew up, uh, born in West Palm Beach, Florida. I grew up in um, North Palm Beach, uh, well, North Palm Beach area. It was actually a very small community called Juneau, kind of like Juneau, Alaska, but not spelt that way. It was J-U-N-O. And it was a very small community. There weren't a lot of people that lived there. Uh, we actually had a, um, it was so... Uh, rural, actually, that we still had a volunteer fire department, which my dad was proudly a member of. I actually still have his uh, his little badge. Yeah, I gave it to my great nephew for him to hold on from his great, great grandfather that he would have that. And so anyways, um, grew up down there and our house was right on the intercoastal waterway. Now, when I was born, my dad had built a house for my mom that was up closer to the road. Uh, it was because she wa She thought she came from Kansas. She met my father uh, in Salina and she met him at the Air Force Base and they ended up getting married. Anyways, uh, she came back to Florida with him and my dad built her house up near the road because she thought, wow, she'd be able to see all the people going by. 
not when there's hardly anybody that lives out there. And of course, it had to be the most picturesque thing you could imagine. Cute, cute house. It had, it only had the two bedrooms, but then there was a bedroom for my mom and dad, and then a bedroom for me and my sister. And I lived in that house until I was about four years and maybe three months old. And my dad had built a white picket fence all the way around our huge front yard. And of course, I have stories uh, where, uh, actually, it's not in this book, but it is in the More Sounds of River's Edge, where when I was in my maniac stage of about nine years old, I decided that I was going to become like Evil Knievel and try leaping my bike over all kinds of things. My advice to you is don't take your bike over a picket fence. It's not a very sane thing for a human to do, unless you're motorized maybe and you have a good lift, but not with a bicycle. Anyways, moving along. Uh, and there were these two live oak trees, very small, and my dad put a bench between them. And before we uh, had actually, before my parents sold the house, the trees had gotten much larger and the bench had become, the sitting area had become much smaller. But it was, uh, it's amazing how the, the bench actually grew into the sides of the trees or they allowed it to grow into the trees. So we lived in that house up near the road because my mom wanted to see the busy, busy traffic, which there wasn't any. And so finally she was bored with that. And by the time I was like four, uh, she decided now she wanted to live on the other part of our property that was down right up next to the intercoastal. Now, right next to the intercoastal would be our house was still a good mm, hundred feet from, from where the seawall was, but still it was closer. And she was able to watch the boats go by which there were, you know, there, we had barges and, and we had all kinds of different uh, pleasure boats. There were yachts that would come down, especially in the wintertime. You'd see a lot of people that would bring their yachts down from up north and travel actually to uh, West Palm and Palm Beach with, with their yachts and dock them there. I remember one year uh, when we had a hurricane that the honey fits was actually anchored behind our house. And my dad said, wow, look out there, it's the honey fits. Didn't mean anything to me, I mean, I was a kid. And then finally my mom said, oh, that's the president's boat. I was like, whoa, President Kennedy's boat's in our backyard? Well, of course it stayed there because they, they brought all the, the large yachts and stuff into the intercoastal to protect it during hurricanes. Uh, it was kind of like a safe harbor. So. Anyway, so now I grew up on the intercoastal the rest of my life that I lived there. I lived on the intercoastal waterway and the sounds at River's Edge. I'm going to show you a picture of the book. There you go. Oh, move it over that way. It's it's got the pictures and stuff. There are areas that actually look like this. And then there are areas to where you've got a lot of mangroves and and the um, sea grapes and all those kind of things that grow down into the water. And sometimes you have where the uh, where they had dredged because when my dad was a kid he told me that they actually used to be able to almost walk across uh, certain sections of the river because it wasn't real deep and it was only about 30 to 35 feet wide well by the time I came along the river was uh, a good wow in some areas it was about 150 feet across and they had dredged it to where big big yachts and sailboats and stuff could come through so anyways, but I grew up down there and my book, The Sounds of River's Edge is starts with me at four and a half and it starts with a story called The Leap of Faith. And I actually thought maybe today, time permitting, it's not a long story, but I thought that I might actually read to you The, uh, the Leap of Faith. So if, if, you're, if you're up for it, um, just hang on and, and see what wild children do when they're like four and a half years old. And go back with me in, in a simpler time. Uh, things weren't so chaotic. It seems like the world today is, is in such fast pace. I mean, come on, I admit it. I hate to say it, but I do. I stand in front of my microwave with 30 seconds still left thinking, how long is this going to take? 
didn't even have a microwave when we were kids. You wanted to warm something up, you did it in the oven or the or the, on the stovetop. You know, microwaves, who would have thunk it? Mm. But what a blessing they are. You stand in front of my coffee pot that can make a cup of coffee very quickly, as opposed to when they used to perk, which actually I still think the coffee that's made in those old percolators where it came up through the top. And every now and then you can still find one. But... That coffee was so good. Now, I'm not saying that the coffee today isn't as good. It's just that I have such good memories of that little percolator. You know, the Maxwell House sound where it was good for the last drop. It was really nice. Okay, so bear with me now, and I'm going to read to you. And this is called A Leap of Faith from the Sounds at River's Edge. Okay, some of the greatest lessons I've learned, I learned while I was alone on sailing ships to foreign lands, or while hunting and exploring deep into the jungles. Maybe you did not have the sea at your back door as I did, and maybe your adventures are in places that I've not yet been. Still, I believe that if you were as I was as a child, then you too know the adventures were as close as a thought and nearer than your next breath. Remember with me now, have you ever laid back in the grass to spot a cloud that looked like a dog or a duck, an elephant, or even a submarine? Played connected dots on a starry night. Found all the hidden objects in the highlights magazines. What about putting playing cards? This, is, this goes way back. Putting playing cards on your spokes of your bicycle to make it sound like a motorcycle. My mom really got mad about that because those were her best pinochle cards. Mm, oh, well. Okay, if any of this sounds familiar, then come with me on a grand adventure of remembering. As I have grown, I have seen the gross error that we as human beings have perpetrated on our youth. Looking back, I see how I have such a vivid imagination that I had when I was a child. Or oh, how I would get lost in the pages of Nancy Drew or sail away to the places like Treasure Island Reading had become, has become a lost art in many areas, and I've even heard one youth say it was too close to being like homework. Oh, what adventures. Instead of encouraging our children to expand their minds with written word, we've trained them to use television and video games almost like babysitters. And in doing so, we've replaced our own importance sometimes in our children's eyes as their heroes. We've gotten so busy trying to make a life that we've forgotten how to live. I'm not going to ask you to compare today's cartoons to yesterday's. There's enough people already on a soapbox about that, and I have plenty of my own. In fact, I'm rather fond of SpongeBob, and I have used it many times as a stress reducer. There are many great animated shows, and not only make you giggle, but some leave you with a lesson to learn. I'm not the cartoon police. No, no. And I'm not going to tell you what you should or should not let your children watch on television. I will, however, tell you that as a child, I've had no reason to not believe what I saw on the screen. Oh, brother. For me to tell a story on a page is so different from being able to see you face to face. You can't see the expressions, or so I've been told in the wild demonstrations of me recounting my tale. So now you have to turn your imagination. Imagine with me my story with you and great wonder and excitement. You ready? Come now and let me tell you a tale. On Saturday mornings, I would get up early, or at least it was hours before anyone else was up, and I'd drag my favorite quilt into the living room, and there I would settle to watch cartoons. Looney Tunes, to be exact. Daffy Duck was one of my favorites. I still smile thinking about how many times Daffy would get his bill slapped off and look surprised with his, his eyes would be huge, you know? No bill. Just a flat face, no bill. Without a bill, his eyes appeared even larger than before. I never thought to rationalize how easy it was to knock it off or how simply to pick it back up and put it on his face. All I knew was it brought large amounts of laughter and smiles. Laughter was my constant companion. In those early morning hours as I lay on the floor with eyes wide in wonder, there were back-to-back -back stories of Sylvester and Tweety, Porky Pig and Roadrunner, 
Bugs and Daffy. One particular episode had me completely in awe. It was all about Bugs Bunny. And once again, faced with the task of how to outwit Elmo Ford, the wabbit hunter. <laughs> oh my. I watched in amazement as Bugs ran from Elmer just to find that he was in another big dilemma. He had run until he ran right to the edge of a cliff with a very long drop. Behind him was Elmer with a gun. What do you do? I had no doubt that Bugs was able to, to solve this problem. And then reaching behind his back, Bugs suddenly had an umbrella. Wow. As Bug looked straight at me, he looked me straight in the eye in the camera. Yeah, I saw him. He held the umbrella and it went pop. That umbrella opened. As Bugs looked me straight in the face with a smile of satisfaction and knowing that once again he had outsmarted that wascally wabbit hunter, he stepped off the edge of that cliff. Ever so gently, he floated to the bottom safely away from Elmer. Oh my gosh. Wow. I wanted to try that. I needed to do that. But how? Remembering that my mom had recently bought a brand new umbrella, I went to the hall closet where it was kept. It was a chocolate brown with gold tips and gold trim on the handle that was curled like a candy cane. Back then, umbrellas were long like walking sticks, and this one was no exception. It was almost as long as I was tall. Well, or so to, so to speak. And so to sneak it out of the house, it had to happen now before anybody else would be getting up to catch me. With the umbrella in hand and me still in my jammies, I went outside to the patio. Now I needed to find a way up so that I would be able to come back down. Looking around the yard, I spotted the perfect way to reach the roof of the house, a tree. I climbed to the top of the concrete picnic table and I was able to reach one of the low limbs of the huge live oak tree that grew in our front yard surrounding the patio. This tree had large limbs that grew directly over the top of our garage. The best part was that the limb began as low so I could reach it and so gently upward toward the roof, the gradual slope was a great help for somebody so small. I remember I was only like four and a half. Once making my way to the limb, I began inching my across the branch. It was difficult, but I straddled the limb like you would if you were riding a horse and moved forward in a squiggly fashion. Being small made it more of a challenge, with, but with fierce determination, I made it to the roof. Once in place, I slowly walked to the edge, replaying in my mind how that bugs had floated so gently to the bottom of that steep cliff. And with the umbrella, soon as my parachute, in the open position, I prepared for my descent. I looked carefully to see if anyone was visible in the house. I was still fairly certain that no one else was awake. I didn't want to get caught with my mom's new umbrella. Certain that there was no one around, I stepped off the roof. I don't remember the time between that first step and the croton bushes that now surrounded me. I can't explain how that the new crumpled and twisted umbrella had gotten under me when moments before it was above me. I was so stunned I didn't even realize that it was my dad that was picking me up out of the hedge. When I finally looked at my dad's face, I was torn somewhere between guilt for getting caught and then the joy for being rescued. But oh, when I heard him laugh and he held me close to him, I knew that everything was gonna be okay. Mom never knew what happened to Umbrella. Dad said that I'd been through enough that day, so he would get her another one. Sometimes we do crazy things like jumping off of a roof with an umbrella. When we see others doing something that looks like fun, something that will make us a part, something that will make us belong, we too step into danger. It seems like danger, although we hate to admit it, has an exciting element all around it. We fear it and yet we embrace it. 
Then we discover that the fall is great and sudden. Then we see that God is not going to stop us from disaster if we choose to go that way. He will not oppose our desires if we want to leap. Oh, but when we see his mercy and his grace and his great love, even in the mess that we ourselves have created, he will lift us up and care for our hurts. It says that sing praise to the Lord, O you saints of his, and give thanks to the remembrance of his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. For weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That's my heavenly father. And even when I have been foolish, he holds me close. There's nothing like the warmth and security of being in the arms of a loving father. The scratches and bruises I received in my fall are a vague memory now. The thing that holds the story fresh in my mind is the trust of the child and the strength of my dad. How would it have differed if daddy weren't there to pick me up? Remember that child within you and let the father, the heavenly father, embrace you and your situation today. There's no thing too big, no thing too foolish, no thing too hard. Run as fast as you can into his arms and don't look back. The past will always be there, but it doesn't have to be your tomorrow. Just because a new umbrella replaced the broken one didn't change the fact that I was still bruised and scratched from my fall. I did, however, learn the experience from the experience, and I no longer leap small buildings or leap from small buildings in a single bound. Now, that's the end of that story. I tell you that story because that's the beginning of the sounds at River's Edge. I was four and a half, and it's stories like that all the way through. There's stories about me and my sister who is four years older than me. We were not best of friends. We were the best sibling rivalry that any two sisters could have. We picked at each other. Uh, we did whatever we could to get each other into trouble. And yet I know that secretly we did still love each other. Because if you picked on my sister, I was coming after you. And if you messed with me, unless you were my cousin Shirley, because that was her best friend. Anyways, unless you were Shirley, uh, she, would, she would stand up for me too. But relationships are so important. Sometimes we miss out on so many small things. Um, the, the smile of a friend. Sometimes just hearing a friendly voice on the phone saying, hey, how are you doing today? The sounds at River's Edge, the reason it's called sounds is because all around us are sounds of life. There's sounds of laughter. There's sounds of crying. Uh, we, we're living in a time right now that I'm so sorry to say that we're losing so many people. There's so many that are dying from just the, the things that we've been fighting for centuries, such as cancer and heart disease and diabetes and every type of thing like that. And now we have the coronavirus that is taking hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, here in the state of Alabama, we've lost 15,000 over that actually. And that's quite a, a, a large amount of people considering that about Alabama is not a hugely populated state, you know, like Florida was when we left it. And it, it's so sad. I've lost, I've lost a cousin that I was raised with. He was only a year older than me, a doctor, a good man. And he died from the COVID. Um, we, we've lost friends. And some people that have been as, as strong, you would say, man, they were as healthy as a horse. We hear tears and crying. But like it said, sorrow, sorrow may, let me turn that off. Sorry. We may mourn that night and sorrow does last. And people say, oh, time heals all wounds. I don't know that time heals it per se. I do know that love heals all things. There's, there's no way around that that love is the healer and the embracer of everything. I would like to say I was perfect, 
I don't make mistakes. You know, I, hey, come on. I only leap off buildings, you know. So you got to figure. If I had a mind like that when I was four and a half, and now I'm 67, and I'm still what you'd consider pretty well crazy. I mean, you know, I, I still do crazy stuff. Um, I don't do crazy things like jumping off of buildings, and, and I don't hide crabs in a, with my sister. I, I mean, I do torment her sometimes, like if we go eating seafood with, like, the lobster crab. Yeah, it's it's like a... It's in there. I just can't seem to get that out. But at the same time, I want you to know, you as a person, whoever's listening to this, you have talents and you have a life and you have a story. Now, not all people are writers, just like not all people are singers and, and not all people can dance and not all people can paint and not all people can are, are salesmen. There are, there are specific people that can do sales that other people can't. You know, all of us have a gift. Some people are just born leaders where others are born followers. But through time, I've learned that the greatest leaders have first to learn how to be a great follower because you need to learn these things. So I'm telling you as my audience, as you listen to me, remember, you have a story. Don't look at your story like, yeah, it's not worth anything because our lives can be a mess. Our lives can be just torn all to pieces, but you were made by God almighty to be a survivor and to be a victorious person. Sometimes we let things get you down. But I'm going to tell you what, just like the sounds at the river's edge, as water, the tides change, they come and they go. As, as things wash in and as they wash out, a lot of the times the cleanest, when the river is going out and it's taking things out into the ocean, a lot of that stuff will never come back into the, no matter how much the tide changes, it's gone. And these are the things that with the sounds that you hear, hold on to those things that are dear, hold on to the cries of the people that you can cry with. Hold on to the, the laughter and the giggles. Hold on to the hellos from a friend. And remember that the sounds of life were all around you. The sound of rain falling on a tin roof, I think is just charming. Now, when it gets to be a hailstorm, that's not too much fun. But when it's a gentle rain, just, just dripping and, and coming down almost like a melody on a metal roof, it, it's great. I mean, it's just, it's relaxing. The sound of, of waves lapping up against the shore are relaxing. Hold on to those things. The first time that one of your kids or one of your loved ones looks at you and says, I love you, you hold on to that. Because one day they're going to look at you and think, I don't like you. And you know how humans are. We're fickle. One day we like you, the next day uh, you, you, I'm, you're not my favorite person. But if the love is there today, it's going to be there tomorrow. They may think it may have gone somewhere, but it's still there. So you guys hang on to these things. And once again, let me tell you, you can go to my website, www.bobbyjmclaren.com. Uh, and I've, I've even got uh, some of my paintings are on there. Not all, but just a few. Got a few of my paintings. Soon to be, we will have my new book, which uh, Reader's Magnet is publishing for me. And it's called the first annual Duck Springs Whistling Contest. It's my first try at writing a children's story. Uh, I'm excited. It is not a true story, but it is a children's story. And uh, they were gracious enough to let me kind of help with the illustrations because I knew what I wanted. And uh, the, the coloring that they've done is outstanding. I'm just excited to get the book in my hand. Oh, and I have. Here we go. Look, look, look. look. Oh, yes. Oh, check it out. This is the cover. Let me move it back so you can see the whole thing. Oh, yeah, there you go. This is the cover. Look at that. Look at the coloring of that. Isn't that nice? That's sweet, huh? I think so, too. Now, am I bragging about my own book? Well, of course I am. <laughs> ah, if I can't brag about my own book, who can, right? So anyways, when, you, when it comes out for pre-sale, oh, my gosh, you guys have got to get it for your kids. I mean, it doesn't matter. They could be four or five years old, you know, and read it with them. 
because there's nothing better in the world than taking a book and sitting down and reading with little kids. I think it's the most exciting thing in the world because you can you can be really demonstrative with it. You know, like, and then the bear was like, rawr, you know, and, and the kids love that stuff. And you can change your voice to, and the man said, you know, and, oh, and the little girl, you know, and it's great. So you can take on all the characters, read the books first. And then when you sit down with your kids or when you sit down with any kids at all, in fact, I would encourage you if you've never done it uh, here in the States, they've got what's called book buddy. And you can usually go join it through the school systems and you can actually go to different grades and you can read books to these kids that a lot of times they don't have somebody that would read to them. So by all means, if you get an opportunity, don't pass that by because kids love stories. And if you read stories to them, it's you'll be surprised how many times that they will be able to read and want to read stories and they'll want to read them back to you. So, hey, all I've got to say is I have enjoyed my time. Let's see, comment, live chat booth. Oh, oh, you like my cover. Oh, thanks. Wow, I love that. So anyways, um, the, the book should be coming out. Uh, hopefully sometime this month, definitely want to have it before Christmas. And so you guys keep on the lookout for it. And like I said, you can go to my website, you can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm trying to think where else I am. Oh, and I'm starting, I, I actually started it like last year, or the first part of this year, but I haven't really done a lot with it. But this year, in fact, in, in the last couple, the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be expanding on my Facebook page called The Sounds of Life. And I'm hoping to put a blog on there. So uh, it's a public site. Anybody can join, anybody can do it. So if you're interested and you'd like to converse with me, which I think would be a blast, I'd like to hear from people all over the country, all over the world, and we'll see where we go from there. And again, I wanna thank Reader's Magnet for the time. I think my time has almost come to an end for this 30 second, 30 second, ooh. 30 minute time, but I would like to say thank you for taking the time to watch this and, and listen to me. And I hope that you all have a wonderful day and I hope that you are all blessed. And I, most of all, I hope that you're healthy. God be with you all. And thank you so much for being there. See ya.